Okay, so uh, this is the title of my talk. And uh, as Lara already mentioned, uh, I did my PhD at the University of Oxford in the Cleantes lab. But currently, uh, I am based at the University of Belgrade uh, in Serbia, which is uh, my home country. And um, I did my work at the Department of Biochemistry. Uh, and uh, all of this work was uh, funded by the Wellcome Trust. So I had a very generous grant to, uh, to do a four-year uh, PhD project. Um, so I just want to give uh, a brief into the introductory slide um, outlining my research interests. Uh, I also uh, left my email address here. So um, if you think we could do something together in the future, I'm always uh, happy to collaborate. Um, so uh, basically, uh, I am interested in molecular interactions that happen in the microbial world. And on one end, uh, I am studying um, these intra-kingdom interactions that happen between bacteria, which are competing against each other uh, for, uh, for different resources. And more specifically, uh, I, I was looking into contact uh, independent competition mechanisms, uh, such as uh, the employment of protein antibiotics called uh, bacteriocins. Uh, and on the other end, I am also uh, looking into the mechanisms involved in the interaction between commensal bacteria and their hosts, uh, more specifically uh, plant hosts. Uh, so um, I am currently uh, with some colleagues in Serbia doing, doing some work on uh, the uh, involvement of secretion systems uh, in this inter-kingdom uh, interaction between uh, bacteria and plants. And we are mostly focusing now on secretion system effector proteins uh, and their role in this, um, in this type of interaction. But today for this talk, I decided to, uh, to uh, present my uh, data uh, on pyocins, uh, specific uh, bacteriocins uh, that are uh, active in the genus of Pseudomonas. So uh, Pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa is a so-called priority pathogen. Uh, which means it's very important to develop new antibiotics uh, against this bacterium. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, has listed Pseudomonas as a pathogen of critical priority for the development of new antibiotics, as you can see here. There are, of course, some other very uh, dangerous and very important pathogens, uh, but Pseudomonas uh, is at the top of the list because um, Today, we can, uh, out of hospitals, we can isolate strains that are resistant to uh, every single commercially available antibiotic that we have. So uh, these are the strains that uh, can cause hospital-acquired infections, which uh, cannot be treated with antibiotics. And uh, these in infections uh, are uh, deadly. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, a new kind of pandemic uh, that has been happening for a while now. And um, we really uh, need new solutions to combat these resistant strains. Um, so Pseudomonas serginosa can uh, infect uh, many different parts of the body, as you can see here in the scheme. Uh, it usually attacks, uh, attacks uh, immun immunocompromised people. Uh, but, uh, you know, these type of infections can ha happen in hospitals quite often, for instance, after a surgery. Uh, the biggest problem are lung infections, uh, specifically in people who have uh, this uh, genetic uh, condition uh, called uh, cystic fibrosis. So um, people with cystic fibrosis uh, produce a very thick mucus in the lungs, and uh, it's very easy for bacteria to uh, stick to the lungs and um, stay basically in the lungs. So pseudomonas can cause chronic infections in these uh, patients, uh, and they uh, do not die from cystic fibrosis. They usually die from a pseudomonas infection, which cannot be treated with uh, antibiotics. 
So um, this is a very hot topic currently. A lot of different research groups, uh, a lot of companies are trying to develop new ways to treat uh, this particular bacterium. And here I listed all these different uh, strategies uh, that are being uh, developed. Um, but the, the research groups uh, group I was working in was particularly focused on um, bacteriocins as a new uh, class of antibiotics. And uh, piocins are actually uh, just a different name for bacteriocins, which are active against uh, different Pseudomonas species, uh, in particular here against uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So uh, what are bacteriocins? Um, so bacteriocins are present in both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, but uh, they're very different between the two groups. And today I will just focus on gram-negative bacteria since Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a gram-negative bacterium. Um, so for all the people who are uh, not uh, doing a lot of microbiology, just uh, a brief reminder, gram-negative bacteria have um, a multi-layered cell envelope, uh, which is very difficult to penetrate with uh, antimicrobials. Um, so uh, bacteriocins uh, have a role in bacterial competition. So these are proteins uh, that are produced uh, by bacteria, by uh, let's say a specific strain of bacteria to compete against uh, other bacteria in the environment. Um, in case of gram-positive bacteria, uh, bacteriocins are normally very small uh, peptides. But in gram-negative bacteria, bacteriocins are very large proteins, about uh, 60 kilodalton in size, and uh, they're composed out of several protein domains, so uh, they have a modular uh, structure. So these are complex folded protein antibiotics, uh, which is quite interesting because when we talk about antibiotics, we are used to uh, small molecules uh, that can easily penetrate the cell envelope. Uh, but here we have uh, a class of antibiotics which are very large and still very efficient in uh, penetrating gram-negative cells. Uh, so they are very, uh, from a fundamental uh, research side, they are very interesting to study uh, protein import into bacterial cells. Um, during my PhD, I was definitely, you know, interested in um, discovering uh, a new antibiotic which is active against uh, Pseudomonas. But on the other end, I really wanted to study how do these huge folded proteins uh, come across the multi-layered cell envelope uh, of bacteria and, and how do they keep their uh, fold and their killing activity uh, during this journey. So uh, I think that this is a very, like from a mechanistical fundamental side, a very interesting research question. So um, why are uh, bacteriocins uh, good uh, candidates for, uh, for new antibiotics? So here in the scheme, you can see um, how do bacteria use bacteriocins to compete against each other. Uh, this is a producing strain, uh, and the producing strain uh, has a bacteriocin, or in case of Pseudomonas, a piocin gene in the genome. Uh, but this gene is always in the same operon with an immunity protein. So um, in the producer, the immunity protein will block the toxic, the enzymatic toxic ac activity of the piocin, and the complex is basically inactive. So the complex gets released out of the producer via a completely unknown mechanism, probably just plain cell lysis. And then uh, the piocin has to recognize uh, the cells of the sensitive bacterial strain. So uh, these are very specific antibiotics. And um, in case of piocins, 
normally uh, they are active only against specific strains of uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So uh, these antibiotics are used for uh, intraspecies uh, competition. There are some other uh, uh, bacteriocins in gram-negative uh, bacteria that, that can have uh, a more broad range of activity, but pyocins are very specific. So uh, the, the sensitive strain, to be sensitive, uh, one strain, first of all, uh, has to lack the negative protein gene completely. Then, uh, in, in addition, the sensitive strain needs to have a specific uh, pyrosine receptor in the cell envelope. And also, it needs to have some other proteins which are required for pyrosine import. So, this green box represents uh, the so called uh, pyrosine uh, translocator which is a protein machinery in the cell envelope that uh, transports uh, this uh, big folded protein antibiotic into the cytoplasm. And um, the entire process is proton motive force dependent, so it requires uh, energy. Once the pyrosin enters the cell, uh, depending on the pyrosin, um, it can kill the cell in different ways. Some pyrosin, well, most pyrosins actually are nucleases, which means that uh, they need to enter the cytoplasm of the sensitive cell. And to kill it, these pyrosins will degrade uh, either DNA or RNA. We have both types of nucleases. Uh, then some pyrosins uh, actually just stay in the cell envelope and kill the cell by uh, forming pores in this uh, inner membrane layer of cell envelope. And some pyrosins actually inhibit uh, the synthesis of the middle layer of the cell envelope, which is the peptidoglycan layer. So we have different killing mechanisms. But uh, the, the main uh, characteristic of uh, pyrosins is specificity, because uh, there is this need for a specific receptor in the cell envelope. So this is both good and bad when you're trying to develop a new antibiotic. It's good to have antibiotics because of the infection. And, uh, you know, you can kill just the bad guys and uh, you will not kill all the good guys. So basically you can keep the integrity of the microbiome uh, of the patient and eradicate just the cause of the infection, which is good. But which is which is bad is uh, that you need to have something that is uh, you know active against your specific uh, target strain. Uh, so the good uh, thing about pyosins is their uh, huge diversity. Bacteria have been competing against each other in the nature for a very very long time, and therefore. Um, a lot of different pyosin genes uh, have evolved and uh, we can exploit uh, this diversity. Also, uh, as you will see on my next slides, uh, pyosins have a very modular structure. So you can basically play with little pieces of different pyosins and com combine uh, pieces of different pyosins to make new antibiotics. Uh, so uh, yeah, there, this is a very, um, interesting diverse uh, group of, of molecules. Uh, in addition, they are very potent and uh, one uh, pyosin molecule is enough to kill a single cell for most uh, pyosins. Uh, so um, we need a very small amount of protein uh, to, uh, to kill uh, cells. Um, yeah, so uh, as I said, uh, this is a very diverse uh, group of uh, molecules. And uh, at the beginning of my PhD, um, together with uh, a colleague, uh, with a bioinformatician, uh, we, did, uh, we did some genome mining to look for new pyosin genes. Um, so basically here in, in this tree, you can see an alignment uh, of uh, different pyosin sequences that uh, came out of this uh, genome mining project. Uh, and um, 
what we aligned here is just one little part of the pyosin protein, which is called the receptor binding domain. So this is what makes a pyosin specific for uh, a certain receptor. And this is what it makes it specific for a certain bacterial strain. Uh, and this is the most uh, diverse part uh, of the protein. All the other bits of the protein are uh, pretty much conserved, um, but the, the receptor binding domain is uh, where we have a lot of diversity. Uh, and um, here in the table, you can see that, that for these different pyosins, for all of them, we can easily predict the mode of action from the conserved uh, cytotoxic uh, domain of the protein. Uh, and as you can see here, most of them are nucleases. Uh, so my work was uh, focused on nuclease uh, pyosins. Uh, but here, as you can see, for, uh, for quite a lot of them, we don't know uh, the receptor. And uh, it's very important to pair up uh, pyosins and pair up their receptor binding domains with specific uh, outer membrane receptors. Because uh, if you know these pairs, uh, you can predict which the cocktail of pyosins you can use to kill um, to kill your pathogen of interest. For example, uh, let's say we isolate a very danger dangerous Pseudomonas uh, isolate from a hospital. You know, it's causing a mess. It's uh, causing infections. We don't have uh, an antibiotic against it. Uh, but we have a lot of pyosins and we know for a lot of pyosin receptors. So um, in the future, we could take this uh, dangerous uh, pathogen and we could do some PCR just to screen for, uh, for pyosin receptors. And we can see which receptors are present in the genome. And then uh, we could decide, okay, we need, for instance, pyosin S2 and pyosin S3 to kill uh, this specific pathogen. Uh, so for my PhD, I uh, wanted to work on these receptors and find some new uh, pyosin receptors. And um, most of my work was focused on these two nuclease uh, pyosins. And in the interest of time, I will only talk about pyosin G because uh, I think uh, there is a very interesting story uh, with the import mechanism of this piocin. Uh, and my talk today will be uh, a bit more, you know, fundamental research than uh, all this clinical stuff that I used uh, for the introduction. So uh, here in the picture, you can see a generalized model of nuclease piocin import. So, uh, this is uh, some of the knowledge I had at the beginning of my PhD. And this knowledge comes from previous research done on some other pyosins and from a lot of uh, previous research, which was done on another group of bacteriosins called colicins. So colicins are same as pyosins, but present in uh, E. coli. Uh, and uh, when I started my PhD, there was uh, a lot of uh, work already done uh, on import mechanisms of colicins. So uh, this is what we know. Uh, pyosins can uh, bind to uh, either the LPS layer uh, or they can bind directly to uh, a receptor protein in the cell uh, envelope. So this bit here is the outer membrane of the gram-negative cell envelope. And uh, then in the next step, pyosins need to translocate through this outer membrane translocator. So uh, for, for, uh, group a, for group A, the LPS is the receptor, and then the pyosin will use a translocator. But for group B, as you can see, the, the, the translocator is also the receptor. And uh, all, uh, all pyosin uh, receptors and translocators um, are these ton B dependent transporters or TBDTs. So uh, they look like a, a barrel. These are 
beta barrels in the outer membrane and they have this uh, plug domain which is uh, blocking the the channel of the barrel uh, tbdts uh, of course uh, they are not uh, present in the genome and in the outer membrane just to import these protein antibiotics they always have some other very important role uh, and normally these are nutrient importers uh, which are uh, very uh, important for uh, survival uh, in um, in some specific conditions. Uh, so, for instance, for Pseudomonas, these are often siderophore importers. Uh, so, these are uh, TBDTs are important for iron uh, acquisition, and uh, this is essential for Pseudomonas to survive in the human host and to cause the infection. So TBDTs are um, usually uh, also virulent factors that uh, enable nutrient acquisition in the host. Uh, so piocins hijack uh, these, uh, these nutrient importers and uh, siderophores uh, and other TBDT dependent nutrients are normally very, very, very tiny molecules, but uh, piocins, they somehow mimic these small molecules, and uh, they somehow exploit these uh, transporters to enter the cell. So uh, TBTs uh, are ton B dependent transporters, which means they also require this uh, ton B uh, protein complex, which is uh, localized in the inner membrane. And uh, uh, ton B has uh, uh, this periplasmic region, uh, so it's it's a motor protein complex coupled uh, with the proton motive force in the inner membrane, and this periplasmic bit of the complex uh, interacts with the plug domain of the TBDT, uh, so it can pull the plug and open the channel of the transporter once a ligand is bound to the transporter. Uh, so for for import of either small nutrients or uh, for import of piocins, uh, we also need the Tom B protein complex to uh, open the the plug and to enable the the import of the piocin. In addition, piocins uh, uh, at the beginning of my PhD, it seemed that piocins can also bind. Uh, ton B. So we had this hypothesis that Ton B is not only pulling the plug of the transporter, but it is also pulling the piocin through the channel of the transporter. But this is something uh, I had to explore uh, a bit further, as you will as you will see on the next slides. And finally, uh, you know, the piocin enters the periplasm. But what happens next? Very little is known about the next steps of the translocation mechanisms of the translocation mechanism. Uh, we don't really know how do piocins cross the, the peptidoglycan layer and how do they cross this uh, inner membrane of the of cell envelope. Uh, so um, there is an idea that uh, there is a specific inner membrane translocator. And um, some work uh, which was done on colicins has suggested that uh, this protease called FTSH uh, is required for inner membrane import. FTSH is uh, an inner membrane protease uh, required for protein quality control. Uh, and in colicins, uh, if you delete FTSH, you, you lose killing activity of colicins. So um, we, can, uh, we can guess that maybe the same protein is uh, essential for piocin import, but uh, we don't really know if this is the actual uh, translocator in the inner membrane. FTSH uh, does indeed form uh, a channel that goes through the inner membrane. Uh, but still, we don't really know if it's directly uh, involved in a bacteriocin import. Um, so um, for uh, for my project, I used uh, piocin G, and this is how the protein looks like. 
It's around uh, 70 kilodalton. This is the immunity protein. Uh, it has the receptor binding domain in the N terminus. Here, uh, before the receptor binding domain, we have um, about 20 uh, unstructured uh, residues that uh, uh, that have uh, this very conserved sequence uh, that is called the ton B box. So um, it looked like this uh, unstructured bit um, might bind to ton B just from the primary uh, protein sequence. Then uh, we have this middle domain, uh, which is very conserved uh, among different uh, bacteriocins in general. Um, so the receptor binding domain is uh, quite different than all the other bacteriocins, but this middle domain is very conserved. And uh, we have the C-terminal cytotoxic domain, which is again, very conserved. It has nuclease activity and uh, it just looks very similar in uh, like in all the other nuclease bacteriocins. And then we have a small immunity protein that binds uh, to the nuclease uh, domain. So in the lab, uh, I would express uh, piocin G together with the immunity protein from a plasmid in E. coli, and I would purify, uh, I would purify the protein uh, as a complex. And this is something that I would use uh, for all of my uh, experiments. So here you can see a plate overlay assay with uh, Pseudomonas um, aeruginosa, PAO1. Uh, and you can see that uh, my piocin is active in the nanomolar range. Uh, I also tested, I didn't show this data here, but I tested different clinical isolates of Pseudomonas and the piocin was uh, active against uh, most of them. Uh, so this is why I kind of focused my efforts on this protein because uh, it can be used in the clinic. It has a, a good coverage for uh, these clinical isolates. So um, my first question was which outer mem which cell envelope proteins are required for the piocin G to kill the cell? And I did a little um, mutant screen. Uh, so we already had a very good mutant library for Pseudomonas in the lab. Um, so it was quite straightforward. I just had to choose specific transposon insertion mutants uh, that I will test uh, against my piocin. And um, I made this selection based on uh, all this work which was done on other bacteriocins, uh, which I already told you about on the previous slides. So uh, first of all, I guessed that my piocin will use a ton B dependent receptors to enter the cell. And in the genome of Pseudomonas, um, I did a search for all the different ton B dependent receptors. I found, uh, so I did some very simple bioinformatics and I found around 36 candidate genes. I, I, I had transposon mutants for all of them. And uh, I tested all of them against my piocin, and one mutant was uh, resistant uh, to the piocin. Uh, so uh, this was uh, a mutant for uh, this hypothetical uh, ton B dependent transporter. Uh, so I wasn't quite sure if you know this is a real uh, gene, a real ton B dependent transporter, but I could see resistance. And if I complement the mutation from a plasmid, uh, I cloned the, the receptor gene in a plasmid, uh, you know, I can restore a killing activity of my piocin, which was uh, very, very interesting. So uh, the, the gene had, uh, you know, a funny numerical name, but uh, I named it her. And um, now it sounds like a random name, but when I show you more data, uh, I promise it will all make uh, a lot of sense. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, so uh, this is how we found the receptor for piocin G. Um, then uh, the next thing uh, was to see if uh, piocin G also requires ton B to, to kill the cells. And there there is three different versions of ton B in the Pseudomonas genome. And uh, the ton B1 mutant was uh, resistant to piocin G. 
So uh, we know we need uh, the receptor her, and we need TOMB1 for, for the killing activity. Uh, then the next question was, uh, is uh, actually uh, FTSH, the protease I was telling you about, uh, also required for this piocin? And indeed, FTSH mutants were resistant to the piocin, so we also need FTSH for the import of the protein antibiotic. Uh, here we did uh, an interesting experiment where we took E. coli. So E. coli is normally resistant to piocin G because uh, this protein antibiotic is specific for uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa strains, right? It cannot kill E. coli. But uh, we, we transformed E. coli with the Pseudomonas TOMB1 and with the HER receptor. And once we do that, E. coli becomes sensitive to piocin G, which means uh, the only pseudomonas specific uh, part of the cell envelope is the receptor and the ton B protein. But then everything else that is involved in the import mechanism is conserved between these two different species. So uh, FTSH, uh, if it's being used in, in the import process, it's the same for uh, for Pseudomonas and from E. coli. It's very conserved between the two species, but still there are, there are some uh, differences in the sequence. Anyhow, um, the, the rest of the import mechanism downstream of the, the receptor uh, seems to be very conserved uh, between these two species. So when we talk about um, the import of the import mechanisms for these folded protein antibiotics, uh, the receptors are very diverse. Uh, and we need to make these pairs between uh, bacteriocins and receptors. But everything that happens downstream of the receptor, uh, my guess is that everything else is going to be quite conserved for all these different uh, nuclease bacteriocins. And the same uh, molecular mechanism is going to be deployed uh, by all of them. So we can use, for instance, piocin G to ask you know, these uh, universal questions for the import of uh, bacteriocins. Uh, to, further, um, to further look into all these uh, import uh, how to say all these translocon uh, candidate uh, proteins uh, from functional gen uh, genetics. I switched to doing uh, uh, doing experiments with purified protein, and uh, I did some pull down assays. So um, I could show that piocin G binds to ton B1, and also the receptor her binds to ton B1. So uh, it's not just that TOMB1, you know, binds to the receptor to pull the plug. It also binds to the piocin, probably to pull it through the receptor, through the pore of the barrel. Here, uh, I purified the receptor, which was quite tricky. If you ever worked with membrane proteins, you know it's uh, quite tricky to purify them. And uh, indeed, these two uh, bind to each other. Uh, and I could also uh, show that the first 255 residues of piocin G can bind to the receptor. So the receptor binding domain is within these uh, 255 residues. Uh, and why did we name the receptor her? Because uh, from uh, we did some analysis of the sequence of the protein. And uh, it seemed like uh, this is a hemin, uh, hemin, sorry, importer. Um, so hemin is, uh, it can buy, bind to iron and uh, it can basically uh, be used by bacteria as a siderophore, as a small molecule that will enable bacteria to scavenge iron from the environment. Uh, so we did some pull downs with uh, her and Hamin, and we we, we uh, managed to demonstrate uh, using spectroscopy that uh, Hamin uh, binds to the receptor, which is this peak here. And if if, if when we add piocin G to the mix, we lose the peak, which means that uh, piocin G and Hamin these two probably use the same binding spot uh, on the receptor. Uh, 
So uh, this receptor is uh, probably a virulence factor. It's probably uh, important uh, for, for the infection process. And I didn't do any work on that myself, but uh, during my PhD and after, after I finished the project, uh, some papers came out and uh, actually this protein is uh, involved in the infection process, which definitely makes it a good uh, antibiotic candidate a good uh, target for, uh, sorry, for an antibiotic. So uh, at this point, uh, I know that PyoCG uses this HER receptor, and I know that I need TOMB1 for the import. And also FTSH is somehow required for the import. So um, in the next uh, part of my project, I've wanted to focus on uh, the events happening after the outer membrane translocation step. Uh, so what happens here? What, how do pyosins, how do folded antibiotics cross the inner membrane? Here we had zero knowledge for uh, bactericins in general. So I wanted to use pyosin G as a model to ask these questions. And um, from the sequence of pyosin G, uh, I found this conserved translocation domain so this is a, a middle domain here. I will go all the way back just to remind you. Okay, here, it is this domain, which is very conserved in different nuclease bacteriocins. So uh, this domain can be found in different, as you can see, very different species of gram-negative bacteria. Uh, it is very conserved, uh, not only in the sequence, but also in the secondary uh, structure. Uh, and it is also present not only in nuclease bacteriocins, but also in type 6 secretion system effectors, uh, which, are, uh, which are toxic proteins that, uh, similar, to bacteria, similar to nuclease bacteriocins, need to cross the uh, entire cell envelope to enter the cytoplasm to kill the cell. So uh, from this, uh, I guessed that this translocation domain is important for inner membrane transport. And uh, I developed uh, a microscopy assay to test this. Uh, so uh, basically I did microscopy with, uh, with uh, spheroplasts, which are bacterial cells treated with EDTA, which will disrupt the outer membrane, and with lysozyme, which will disrupt the peptidoglycan layer. So I am completely bypassing the outer membrane translocation step, and I can just look into the inner membrane translocation step, and I have a fluorescently labeled pyosin. So if the pyosin enters the, the the cell, it is protected by the inner membrane. Uh, and then I add trypsin to my cells, which is a protease. So uh, if the pyosin is inside of this spheroplast, this, uh, perma this permeable cell that doesn't have the outer membrane, uh, so if I add trypsin, the pyosin is protected and it will not be degraded by trypsin. But if there is no import, the pyosin will stay on the surface of the inner membrane. And then uh, when I add trypsin, it will be degraded. And uh, therefore, I will not have any fluorescent signal inside of the spheroplast after trypsin treatment. So in this way, I could distinguish if my pyosin is being translocated across the inner membrane or if it's not being translocated. So uh, very briefly, I will show you the data. Um, so first of all, this is just the full length protein. And here I can see that after trypsin treatment, I have signal in spheroplasts. Uh, again, I did everything also with intact cells uh, in parallel. So uh, I can compare the two. And uh, this tells me basically, okay, your full length fluorescent protein works well. It can be imported into spheroplasts which means that I do not need outer membrane for transport. If, uh, if I get rid of the outer membrane, I can still import my uh, pyosin inside of the spheroplast. Uh, then if I uh, chop off the cytotoxic domain, the C-terminal part of the protein, I still get import, which tells me, okay, for inner membrane translocation, I need just these two parts. I don't need a cytotoxic domain. 
Then if I get rid of the translocation domain, the middle conserved domain, I just have the receptor binding domain, I completely lose inner membrane transport, which means that uh, the, the translocation domain is essential for inner membrane transport. Uh, so this is a really cool assay. I played around with it a lot. So I took my TOMP1 mutant as well. And my TOMP1 mutant, uh, if I lead TOMP1, uh, I completely lose uh, import into spheroplasts. So we already knew from previous work that we need TOMP1 for outer membrane translocation. As I told you, Piacin G binds to TOMB1, TOMB1 pulls the plug of the receptor, and TOMB1 also pulls Piacin G through the receptor. But from this data, we can also see that TOMB1 is required not only for the outer membrane translocation step, but also for the inner membrane translocation step. Not only that, TOMB1 also needs to be coupled to the proton motive force. So here we have a mutant of TOMB1, which is, um, you know, TOMB1 is still there. It has the binding cap capacity. It can bind to, to periplasmic proteins, but it is not coupled to the proton motive force. And uh, this uh, mutant cannot import piocin G into the spheroplast. So we need TOMB1 to be uh, an active motor. We need uh, it to be coupled with, with energy. Uh, so it is actively being involved in the import of the folded antibiotic, uh, you know, across the inner membrane in the, into the cytoplasm. Uh, and in, the, in addition, we, we could also uh, identify uh, the TONB binding region in the piocin. So if you delete uh, the first 30 residues in the unstructured end terminus of the protein, you lose killing activity and you also lose uh, translocation across the inner membrane. And you also, in pull down assays, we, we could also see that we lose uh, binding to TOMB1. And finally, uh, we did the same experiment with FTSH. So uh, once you delete FTSH, you completely lose uh, translocation across inner membrane specifically. So, uh, FTSH is uh, required also for inner for the inner membrane translocation uh, step, as you can see here. Uh, in intact cells, uh, so you don't need FTSH uh, for the piocin to cross the outer membrane, but you do need FTSH for piocin to cross the inner membrane. In addition, uh, FTSH needs to be proteolytically active. Uh, for inner membrane transports. So we here we have a mutant of FTSH, which has one mutation knocks out the proteolytic of this protein. And uh, once we do that, we completely lose uh, inner membrane transport. So uh, to conclude, um, what do we need for inner membrane transport of uh, these folded protein antibiotics? We found a conserved uh, translocation domain. Uh, we need TOMB binding. Uh, we need TOMB to be coupled to the proton motive force. And we also need uh, the protease activity of FTSH. So uh, based on this data, uh, so for, for, the, for the conclusion as well, uh, I drew this uh, import model uh, so this is what happens in the outer membrane. The receptor binding domain binds to the receptor, to the TOMB dependent receptor. Uh, the immunity protein uh, probably gets released early on. Uh, and then uh, the, the TOMB1 protein is coupled to the proton motive force. It pulls the plug to open the receptor, but then it also binds to the end terminus of the piocin. So in the periplasm, uh, the piocin uh, is bound to TOMB1, and this is uh, basically docking the piocin for the next translocation step, which is the inner membrane translocation step. And uh, for this step, we need the middle translocation domain. Uh, so this domain is being involved in some protein-protein interactions 
with inner membrane proteins to cross the inner membrane. Potentially, we need the FTSH protease to cross the inner membrane, and we need the protease activity of FTSH. So it is possible that FTSH is uh, chopping the, the piocin during import, so only the cytotoxic domain gets inside of the cell. And maybe there is other in the membrane proteins which are involved in this uh, mechanism. So uh, next research questions would be, uh, you know, to kind of try and maybe do some cross-linking, some protein biochemistry to see if bacteriocins are indeed going through the channel of FSH. Um, then to do some to look into uh, this part, which part of the folded protein antibiotic is actually reaching the cytoplasm? Uh, you know, is it the entire protein? Uh, does something from the protein, uh, does it get degraded during the uh, We need to do, you know, further testing to kind of complete uh, this model. Um, so yeah, I just want to acknowledge uh, some people from the Clientus lab. Uh, I had a lot of help during during my PhD, this is a very large uh, group. Uh, so these are my PhD supervisors, Colin Clientes and Martin Maiden. Um, Connor is a bioinformatician who was uh, working with me on this project. Then we had some collab collaborators uh, in Glasgow, uh, Khadija uh, who helped me with some experiments. Uh, then in Clientes lab, uh, Renata, does a lot of protein purification, so she helped me a lot with uh, purifying some of the trickier proteins. And Nick was my uh, co-supervisor or my bench supervisor uh, who did, you know, day-to-day -day work uh, with me. Um, so, yeah, uh, so now, as I said, uh, I am uh, back to Serbia, and uh, I am not doing any uh, I'm not doing a lot of piocin work at the minute. Uh, the, the research group uh, I am a part of, it, they are interested in these competition mechanisms. So uh, we might uh, do some more work with uh, some plant pathogens and maybe look for uh, bacteriocins that are specific for plant pathogens. But uh, I am mostly focusing my efforts on these inter-kingdom interactions. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, this is my email address. If if you want to contact me for any reason, feel free to do so. And of course, thank you for uh, for your attention.